The U.S. Army Rangers, that well, those of us that are familiar with them, are the most, some of the most well-trained military uh, soldiers in the world. Uh, the Rangers' motto is that Rangers go first, right? L uh, Rangers lead the way. Uh, they did in Normandy in 1944, D-Day. They did in Grenada in 1983. They did it again in Panama in 1989. And after September 11th, right, 2001, the Rangers were the very first people on the Afghan soil uh, to engage in that uh, battle and war. Uh, the Rangers have a code, and it's really an acrostic. And so I'm not going to give you uh, that acrostic today, even though a Ranger uh, in the early service came up to me and could quote the whole thing, uh, but uh, I, won't, I won't give you the whole thing, but I will give you two statements out of the Ranger Code, right? It says their objective is to complete the mission, though they may end up as a lone survivor. Hey, the mission is the most important thing, and we will complete the mission even if I'm the lone survivor. And then the other one is, uh, I will never leave a fallen comrade, comrade behind. In other words, hey, watch this. Complete the mission and don't leave anyone behind. Jesus said almost exactly the same thing. Complete the mission and don't leave anybody behind. In the Gospel of Matthew, we have this great, great commission and so I want to read it to you. Those of you that have been in church uh, a long time probably have this memorized. And Jesus came and he spoke to them, the disciples, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So because I have all this authority, I'm telling you, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then Jesus amened himself. That's pretty significant. So every Sunday, I give you a big idea, right? Well, today's a long one, all right? Here we go. The deepest desire our Lord Jesus has is that people will be redeemed. That's the biggest desire that Jesus has, right? When you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the theme is the same, the redemption of mankind. Jesus wants people to be saved, and then he wants those of us that have been saved to catch his heart for a lost and dying world. And so here's what Jesus said. He begins by telling us that all authority, all power, all right, all dominion, all ownership and rulership is his. All authority has been given to me, hey, in heaven and in earth, and I want you to know you need to go into all the world. He has the authority over us. He is the commander in chief. His death, his burial, his resurrection gave him the right, the power, and the authority to tell you and I, go into all the world. And he did tell us to go, watch what he said, go therefore and make disciples. Go, go, get off of your blessed assurance and go. Get out of your comfort zone and go, right? Eight different times after Jesus rose from the dead, he spoke to his disciples and he said the same thing eight different times in all the gospels. He said, go, 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 go. Go tell people how they can be saved, right? I love John 20, verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Isn't it very interesting? When we think about peace, we think that peace is given for comfort, but notice Jesus said peace is given for mission. Did you catch that? Peace was given for mission. As you go, I will give you peace. We got to be ready to go at all times. The Rangers, uh, the rapid deployment 
uh, unit, right? The, the rangers have to be ready at a moment's notice. As a matter of fact, the rangers can, when, you, when the commander-in-chief says go, the rangers can be anywhere in the world in less than 18 hours ready to be on the battlefield for action. When the commander-in-chief says go, you need to go. You see, the mission is mandatory, not optional. You don't get a vote. Uh, you, you don't get to say, well, you know, I'm going to sit this one out, Okay. No, the commander-in-chief says, hey, you need to go. So the mission is mandatory, not optional. And so it's not the great suggestion. <laughs> it's the great commission. I'm not suggesting you go. I'm telling you to go, right? Jesus said, go. You see, they didn't have TV back then, right? They didn't have the internet. They didn't have money. They didn't have big buildings. They didn't have uh, all the stuff that we have today. But what they did have, they had excited people who had been saved and couldn't get over the fact of being saved. And so they want to go tell everybody else how they also could be saved. They had this grand submission to the Great Commission. They had orders from headquarters. Hey, leave nobody behind. Go into all the world. So the deepest desire that Jesus has is that people would be saved, to be redeemed. And then his desire is for those of us that know him to get a burden for people that don't know him. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but when you receive power, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will, you will be a witness. You will go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. You will go. That's an audacious assignment, is it not? Go into all the world. Evangelize. We get scared when we hear that word, right? Evangelize. What does that mean? It means to share the good news, the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are to share the good news that Jesus died for you, was buried, and got up from the grave, and he can save you and change you. That is our Mission. That is what we're supposed to do because people are searching. I was asked, I was interviewed, camera in my face. I was asked, um, what uh, makes you, uh, motivates you? What brings you back to El Salvador? Uh, what have you learned since you've been coming? That's the question. What have you learned? And here's what I said I've been to 30 countries and everybody really is the same. Everybody's really the same. Everybody, they want to grow up, get married, provide food, right? They just want to live life and be happy. Everybody wants the same thing. It doesn't matter where you're at. Everybody's searching for peace. And everybody in the world has a hole in their heart. There are people watching online right now. There are people in this building right now that you realize you have a hole in your heart. There's a vacuum, and you're trying to fill it. You've tried to fill it with drugs. You've tried to fill it with alcohol. You've tried to fill it with sex. You've tried to fill it with working 80 hours and having a big bank account and living in a certain house and driving a certain car. And, and so you've tried everything you can to fill a hole in your heart when God is the one that created you with the whole. So doesn't it make sense that if he's the one that created you with the whole, he's the only one that can fill it. And so go into all the world and tell people, share the good news. We're on the bus and Michael and I are having a conversation that was just up here, Michael. And he said, yeah, this is my eighth mission trip and we've done so many awesome things. And we should, listen to me, don't misunderstand. We should do awesome things. We should provide water. We should provide food. We, we fed the poor when we were in El Salvador, okay? We fed the poor. Uh, we went to what we would call a soup kitchen where Pastor Carlos, a great man of God, has this ministry and feeds them rice and beans. Many of them, that's the only meal they get that day. And so at lunch, he feeds them rice and beans. And we have spent thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars helping feed poor people, not only in El Salvador, but around the world. And so we come in there and we serve those children. But this time, 
we didn't want a, them to have rice and beans, so we wanted to bring them something special. So we ordered Pizza Hut. <laughs> and we had Pizza Hut come in, and we served those children Pizza Hut, and just about every one of them asked for more, okay? I mean, can I have another slice, you know? And so we kept, uh, you know, yes, we should feed the poor. Uh, we, should, we should feed people because... People are people, and dignity tells us that people deserve water, and they deserve food, and, and they deserve uh, different things, and, and, and orphans. The Bible is so clear about you and I engaging in the poor. The Bible is so clear about us being engaged with the marginalized. The Bible is so clear that we, he, James, the brother of Jesus, said, hey, if you don't care for the widow and the orphan, your religion is in vain. He says, you talk a whole lot. But you don't do a whole lot, James said, right? And so we engage with, with the orphanage there. And we have spent thousands of dollars, this church, in that orphanage. They thanked us. I'm not being funny. and I, I probably shouldn't even say this. I forgot what we did last year, how we helped them with the well. I forgot. I really did. I, we were involved in so many places. I forgot. And they're thanking us for doing something so significant to help them have water in their orphanage. We brought them all socks. We brought them all a blanket. I don't really know why we brought them a blanket because it's like 90 degrees in El Salvador. But anyway, we brought them a blanket, but they used it at night for sure. They loved it. We should do all that. We should do all that. But we got to give them Jesus. You understand that? We just can't just give them water. We can't just feed them. We just can't love on them and bring them socks. We've got to go further and give them the gospel. I tell you what Jesus said. You know, I've got to bring Jesus into this whole thing, right? For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Why did Jesus come to the earth? To seek and save that which was lost. Jesus fed people. And then he preached the gospel to them, right? He met their physical need, but then he didn't just meet their physical need. He shared himself, right? So we got to provide for those things for sure. But Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. People are lost, and we need to share with them. Jesus said, you and I are to be fishers of men, not just keepers of the aquarium, but fishers of men to go out and tell people. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask you several big questions today. Who is in heaven right now because of you? Three people that went on our trip had never led a person to Christ in their life. But now they can say, hey, I've led like 30 or 40 people in one week, right? Who's in heaven right now because of you? Who's in heaven right now because you shared the gospel? You shared your story. When's the last time you shared your story? I had somebody at the 9 o'clock hour say to me, well, I don't really have that much of a testimony. And you heard Marie say that, right? And 18-year-old Alexa, boy, we had fun with her all week long. Alexa, go get me a drink. Alexa, do, you know, oh, we had fun with her all week long. We bore a lot of abuse, that little girl. For, you, know, you know what I mean? Like, man, we, Alexa, she shared at the 9 o'clock hour, and she said at the 9 o'clock hour, I didn't think I had really a powerful testimony, but when I shared it, so many people came up to me and told me that it really helped them. When's the last time you shared your story? When's the last time you shared the gospel? Listen, for some of you, when's the last time you invited a lost person to church? Man, how do we get people saved in church? Well, lost people got to be in church. Lost people can't be saved in church if nobody that's saved invited them to come to church. Dang. Our mission is evangelism. we got to complete the mission. We can't leave anybody behind. In Jerusalem, after Jesus rose from the dead, 20 years later, the population in Jerusalem was 200,000 people. Do you know how many of them were Christian? 100,000 of them. Half of the population, 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead, half of the entire population were saved. 
Why? Because 12 people got excited about their sins being forgiven and could not keep that to themselves. So they had to go tell that message to everybody. Evangelism is our mission. It's why we exist as a church. The church is the only organization that exists for people that don't yet belong to it. Do you understand that? So Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples. Disciples. That word disciples is used 239 times in the New Testament. That's an important word, right? A disciple is where we get the word discipline from, someone who is disciplined in the teachings of Jesus, okay? So a disciple is a follower of Jesus that is disciplined in those teachings, right? And so salvation is an event. You get saved. You ask Christ into your life. That is an event. Growth is a process. Discipleship is a process, right? Another word for discipleship is sanctification, right? My growth in Christ, all right? And so I get saved, event, then I grow. I get discipled, and it takes time and effort. Growth is not automatic. That's why we offer opportunities for you to grow, like on Wednesday nights, right? Hey, here's three weeks that you can take on a Wednesday and grow in your faith. We want you to grow. And so when you got saved, when you crossed that line of faith and you invited Christ in your heart, you started a journey, an amazing journey. I got saved, as you guys know, I didn't grow up in church, right? So I get saved and uh, I, I walk forward at a crusade. I get saved. The next Sunday I go to church, I go forward because the preacher said, if you got saved at the crusade or you get saved right now, come forward. Okay. I come forward. I grab his hand. Yes, I got saved last Sunday night. Awesome, man. Come up tonight and be baptized. Jesus said, be baptized. Well, okay, I'll be there tonight. So I showed up that night, right? And uh, I got baptized, right? Then they said, hey, everybody needs to be in a small group. But we didn't call it that back then. We called it Sunday school. Come on, somebody, somebody give me some Sunday school action, right? We called it Sunday school, right? Now we call it a small group. But the same concept, right? Hey, you go and you learn. And so we went to Sunday school. And then back then in those days, right? I've been a Christian 36 years now. We had what was called church training, all right? You showed up that night at 5 o'clock because church was at 6, and you went to church training, and you got discipled. And then you showed up on Tuesday night because we had Tuesday night visitation. Come on, somebody help me. Tuesday night visitation, right? Feed you a little meal, and then you went and saw people that visited the church that previous Sunday and knocked on their door and said, hey, you visited our church last Sunday. We want to come visit you. Can we come in? And you went in and sat in their living room, and then you told them how they could be saved. And then they got saved, and they came to church that Sunday, and they made their decision public. And then they followed through in baptism, and they grew in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. I got saved. I started giving my testimony, and I was only a Christian three months. And, uh, man, I, call, I called uh, uh, Job, Job. I called Psalms, Palms, right? Malachi, right? I called him Malachi, the Italian prophet, right? Uh, you, know, I, you know, a hypocrite, hypocrisy. Not hypocrisy, hypocrisy, okay? And so yeah, I didn't know anything. I'm saved three months. I'm just sharing Jesus saved me. That's all. This man who was a chaplain named Tony Sellers of Cape Fear Gospel Rescue Mission said to me, hey, I want to take you to lunch. You, you free? I said, yeah. Hey, free lunch? Shoot. I had to hitchhike there to, to speak at that place. So I didn't have a car. Yeah, I'll take a free lunch. So he went and bought me my lunch, and he looked over at me, so serious, and he said, I've been praying. That God would send me a Timothy. And I looked at him and said, my name is Steve. <laughs> he said, no, what that means is somebody I can disciple. Well, you know, why don't you come to my house this Friday night? So I went that Friday night and I went to his house at Vicky's in here every Friday night for a year. And he taught me the Bible four hours. I just sat and he just preached and taught me for four hours. And then he and I prayed all night long. 
for the first year I was a Christian. He discipled me. You get saved, then you start a journey of discipleship. And have you noticed that the more you spend time with somebody, the more of their attributes you take on? So the more you spend with Jesus, the more like him you become. There's no seniority in the kingdom of heaven. Well, I've been saved 40 years. No, that's not the question. Not how long you've been saved. How how are you growing? Are you still growing? Are you still learning scripture? Are you still being discipled? Are you discipling anybody? Are you growing? Well, I can't disciple anybody. Really? If you're saved, you can disciple somebody. Well, I don't know a whole lot. Let me tell you what you do. Listen carefully. You give what you got. You just give what you got. Well, I don't really know a whole lot. Well, you know more than that person just got saved. So just give them what you got. That's what discipling is. Hey, uh, Ricky is at the 9 o'clock hour. Ricky meets with eight, nine men every Thursday night in his home. George Fandos meets right here on Monday night with six or seven guys. They're walking through 1 Peter. Disciple somebody. Give somebody what you got. Even if it's not a whole lot, it's more than what they have. He says to go and do this to all nations. And here's where we miss it in church. All nations. Greek word, ethnos. Go to all ethnic groups all over the world. People that don't look like you. If you really want to know how diverse you are, look at your Facebook friends. And you'll learn really quick how diverse you really are. One billion people have no access to the gospel. One billion people have no access to the gospel. In that 1040 window in North Vietnam, we didn't choose South Vietnam, we chose North Vietnam. Dang. Because the commander in chief said, go into all the world. Well, Pastor Steve, I'll be honest with you. I really feel called to America. What you really mean is you feel called to comfort. You don't want to get a passport. You don't want to get on a plane, and you don't want to go, and you don't want to spend money or raise money to go to a third world country. Do you know that America only represents 3.9% of the entire world, but yet God has a heart for the other 96% as well? Hmm. So what you're saying is that I only have the same heart God has, but I only have 3.9% of God's heart. The world. Can't leave anybody behind. There's children in Vietnam that have never even heard the name of Jesus. But yet, because of world vision... They're hearing about, hey, we can help your poverty. Hey, we can help you with education. We can give some hope to hopelessness. And then you and I can get on a plane next year and go visit those kids that we supported and tell their mom and dad why we supported them. Because we want to tell you about Jesus. Dang. Watch this, verse 19. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations and baptize them, right? Baptism is identification. Baptism says, hey, I really meant this decision, right? Baptism means I identify with Jesus, his death, his burial, and the resurrection. We're going to baptize. We baptize three at the 9 o'clock hour. We're going to baptize at this hour. And uh, when we baptize, you're saying, hey, I'm saved. I'm not ashamed. Jesus lives inside of me, right? It's, it's bold. And that's what we're going to do today. And that's what he told us to do. Go and baptize people. Many of you need to get baptized. Did you know the book of Hebrews says that baptism is elementary? It's elementary. You get saved, the very first thing you ought to do after that is get baptized. Sign me up. There's people in this room right now watching online. You got saved, but you haven't followed through in baptism. Why? Why? You ought to do it today. You you ought to do it today. You say, well, I don't have clothes. We got clothes back there for you. We, we got it. We got a blow dryer back there. I know some of you don't need a blow dryer. But we got them back there. We got deodorant back there. We got makeup back there, lady. We got it all back there. So if you really want to obey God today, you could go ahead and do that today and get baptized. Some of you 
got baptized, and then later on in life got saved. And so you got the horse before the cart. And so you need to... You got the horse before the cart, yeah. <laughs> or the cart before the horse. Ah, let me tell you what Jesus said. Don't be laughing at me. <laughs> Jesus said, evangelize, disciple, baptize. That's what he said, dude. Go do it. That's the mission. Go do it. So how are you doing? Well, you know, Pastor Steve, I can't baptize anybody. Why? I'm not ordained. I've never read that in the Bible. If you lead somebody to Jesus, you lead your friend to Christ, you can baptize them. Absolutely. If you're a woman and you lead somebody to Jesus, you can baptize them. Well, Pastor Steve, what would happen if like 20 of us led our friends to Christ? And that, how long would that take? I would gladly sit there and cut the, sherm, the sermon short to hear, watch 20 people baptize their friends. <laughs> Dang. Talking about revival, that would be revival, right? So yeah, you can baptize your friends. You lead them, you can baptize them. And then you can disciple them and work with them. All right. In the military, they have a term uh, called uh, AWOL. Rob, you know, right? Ex-Army over here, right? AWOL. And AWOL means absent without leave, right? In the military, if you're AWOL, absent without leave, listen carefully, over 30 days, it's a federal offense. A federal offense. You're not on mission. You're not, listen to this, you're not where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be on mission, but yet you're somewhere else. You're AWOL, and you've been gone 30 days. Hey, they're going to issue a warrant for your arrest because you have gotten off track. You have left your post. Dang. And they're going to come arrest your butt and throw you in jail because it's that serious. Because the mission is that serious. Are you AWOL? Are you AWOL? Are you absent without leave? Are you supposed to be in a position on the battlefield sharing the gospel of Christ, but you're AWOL? Mm. One last thing. Teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And watch it. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Pastor, I'm scared. I don't know how to start the conversation. I don't know how to begin the conversation. March 17th, Friday night, just a few weeks from now, I will t buy your meal on a Friday night, and I will teach you for two and a half hours how to share the gospel. I'll show you how to do it, Okay. Just like I just did in El Salvador. Hey, watch me do it. This is how you engage people, blah, 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 and let's go do it. And then they went and did it. I'm going to show you how to do it next month. I'm afraid. I'm terrified. Well, you got the assurance that Jesus, I'm going to be with you. Well, what if they reject me? They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting him. You're just a delivery person. All you're doing is sharing the message. I have no pressure, no pressure at all. When I stand here on Sunday and I can say, come to Jesus, come, and nobody comes, right? Guess what? I don't have the pressure of that. I'm not sitting there going, oh, my God, I didn't do a good job because people ain't coming forward. I have zero pressure of that. It's not up to me. My job is to proclaim the message. That's my job. It's your job to respond to it. So I don't have any pressure, really, none at all. It's the Spirit of God moving in your life. So we got we to gotta go. Some of you remember this story. You saw the movie, The Lone Survivor, right? The story of Marcus Luttrell, right? Some of you shaking your head, right? The Navy SEAL, right? Uh, and if you remember that story, because Mark Wahlberg was in the movie, and like anything that dude's in, we're going to watch. Come on. 
Ladies, don't, don't act like, you know, you don't know what I'm talking about. I got a man crush on Mark Wahlberg myself. You know what I'm saying? I mean, dang. You know, you know what I mean? Come on, Mark Wahlberg, right? And so he was in that movie, right? Lone Survivor, right? And you remember that story, how he got in that village, right? Do you, but you probably don't know or you don't remember listening in this part of the movie. Do you know who went and rescued him? The Rangers. The Rangers. Because they are always on go and ready. Because that's their mission, to rescue. That's our mission, to rescue people. So we're going to Costa Rica. Why aren't you signing up? We're going to Africa. It's too late because we're going next month. (laughs) But Costa Rica is coming right around the corner. Why aren't you going? Well, I don't have the money. You put out... I'm going to Costa Rica. Who wants to help me? Trust me, they're going to help you go. There's people in this church right now, they would love to go, but they can't go because of physical reasons, but they got a checkbook, and they're going to help you go. Vietnam, man, these kids, uh, I got so much more. I'm just going to give some takeaways because I'm hungry. Here we go. If you're visiting for the first time, takeaways means we're getting ready to end the service. All right, here we go. Takeaways or end the preaching. Our responsibility to evangelize should excite us, not frighten us. It should bring joy and not guilt. I don't want you to leave here today going, I'm a scum of the earth Christian. I've never shared the gospel before. I've never told my story. I'm just scum. I'm a horrible Christian, and I just feel so guilty about it. I don't want you to feel that way because as soon as you walk out that door, that guilt will be gone. I want you to realize that you have been saved and forgiven, if indeed you have. And there's people that you work with people that are around you at school, people that you've known for years that you've never told them. They, they may watch you. Your neighbor may watch you get in your car, and they're just assuming that you're going to church on Sunday, right? And you are, but maybe you need to knock on that door because you've lived next door to them for like 10 years, and maybe you ought to say, you know, I've never really told you why on Sunday I actually get up and go to church. It's because Jesus changed me. It's our responsibility. Number two, takeaway. Lost people matter to God, therefore they should matter to us. They matter to God. You were once lost. They matter to God. They should matter to us. We should. Yes, I want to tell that person about Jesus. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm scared. I don't know what to exactly say, but I know that I got to tell them. And then, the big idea, the takeaway, last takeaway. The deepest desire of our Lord Jesus has is that people would be redeemed, saved, born again into the family of God, and that those people that get saved, redeemed, would catch his heart for a lost and dying world. Jesus has a heart for people. God help us as a church. It's so easy to forget. It's so easy to get busy without sharing the good news. So you're watching online, you're in this building, you're a Christian, you say, you know what? God, my heart is hard. My eyes are dry. It's been a long time since I've shared. God, I've never shared. What would happen today if you literally flooded this place and said, God, break my heart for lost people. God, I've got family members. I had a a man a little older than me come to me and say, my son, uh, and blah, 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 I won't tell you all the story. He said, I got to know how to tell him how to be saved. And I said, March 17th, I'll tell you. I'll show you how you can tell your son how to be saved. And so maybe you got God, break my heart. Maybe you're here today or you're watching online and you're not a Christian. You don't know that your sins have ever been forgiven. You've still got that hole in your heart. You're still trying to fill it with stuff and try to make you feel good. But yet you're not a Christian. You've never stepped over that line of faith and said, God, here's my heart. Here's my life. Save me. Change me. You need to do that today. Today. 
settle that issue once and for all. You'd be glad you did. Let's pray together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. And in this quiet moment, God, break my heart. God, my eyes are dry. My heart's cold. My mouth's been closed too long. God, let me share the good news. Others, Pastor Steve, I don't know right now that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know as well as I know my own name that if I was to take my last breath today that I would be in heaven. I don't know that my sins have ever really been forgiven. I don't know that I've actually really committed my life to Jesus. Today's your day. Today's your day. And if that's you, God is pulling, tugging at that heart. That I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. As I say it out loud, say it in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, just say it to him. Lord Jesus, God, I don't know that if I died right now, I'd be in heaven. But I want to know. I know that I've sinned against you and I really am sorry. And today I'm willing to turn away from my sin and, and turn to you, God. I believe you died. I believe you rose from the dead. And right now I'm giving you my heart. I'm giving you my life. Save me. Forgive me. Change me. Thank you, God, for hearing my prayer. We are so excited that today you decided to join us online. We hope today that you were encouraged and blessed by the Word of God and encouraged today to walk with God in a deeper, more intimate way. For some of you, you just prayed that prayer with us. You just invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, do you realize that Jesus just saved you? Your sins just got forgiven. And that is the greatest thing in all the world. Matter of fact, the Bible says that all of heaven throws a party because you just said yes to Jesus Christ. And so we want to encourage you to read the Bible, to pray, to find you a, a church home that you may be involved in, or even on this online campus we've got going on here, or I want to encourage you, if you just prayed that prayer, to let us know about that. Matter of fact, you can text your response to 470-509-5139. I want to encourage you to do that right now. Don't wait. You don't have to think about it. If you just pray that prayer, text that response to us and let us know, and then we will get back with you and help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, thanks for watching us online.